We could be opening the book of Job, but I was thinking, Job chapter 14, while Brother Jackson was teaching about really a, a sobering thought, if you ever just sit and think about the great forgiveness that we have in Christ. So I think if we would really examine ourselves, we would say like Job, I am vile, what shall I answer to thee, but hold I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Then the scriptures go further in Ephesians chapter 4 and tell us, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's a tall order for the flesh, but it's just as much and just in the same fashion that God has forgiven us, we are to forgive others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Considering how much we've been forgiven, we ought to be a forgiving people. But Job chapter 14. I'd like to look Lord willing, at the first 12 verses here. Here Job seems to be really talking about himself, but it applies to all of mankind. Again, verse number one of Job chapter 14, it says, Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. Amen. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such a one and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as an hireling his day. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that the tender branches thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof lacks old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant. But man dieth and wastes away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the Blood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have to go with that people here today, Lord. And we ask that you bless now as we look into thy word, Lord, that you would set up by the saints, that the name of Christ would be lifted up. Thou wouldst be glorified, that you would even save souls here, Lord. We thank you for Christ and the forgiveness which we have in him. Help us to be more, of a, more faithful to thee, more busy about the work you've called us to do. Especially as we realize our days here are truly few. We pray to be above Larry, to give him a safe travel back, Lord. To help him as he pastors his church here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask all these things. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> well, here Job is conversing with God and he starts out by saying man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble so that first part might seem obvious man, you know, only a woman can give birth that's the only way to be born to be born of a woman but yet the world will teach that man can man can be women and women can be men and men can give birth. No, there's no such thing. A man that is born or a woman, he says, is of few days. In comparison to eternity, we have very few days here on earth. Yeah. In the light of human history, it's our life is just but a blimp on the map, if you will. So Psalms 39, verse 5, we can turn there for just a moment. It says, Behold, thou hast made my day as a hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man his best day is altogether vanity. See who it is. He says, You make my day as a hand breath, just as a short little distance, just width of a hand. He says, And mine age is nothing before thee. Considering God and His eternality, both past, 
present and future. He, we are nothing before him. We are, even the oldest of men, even if you want to compare Methuselah, the oldest person ever lived, he is, his age is as nothing in comparison to God, in comparison to eternity. And with these few days that we have, how are we going to live them? Live them for God or are we going to live them for self? And the world teaches to you know, have fun, to live it up, to get all the enjoyment you can. Oh, if we are a child of God, how we ought to be striving to spend our days for, for Him and His service. I think many people, when they come into their life, will realize they wasted their few days. Even many that are saved, when they stand before God, will realize they've wasted a lot of their days. We need to be considerate of how we spend our few days here in this life. And it says, man is born, woman is a few days and full of trouble. Life is often full of turmoil and problems, but especially if you try to serve God. I think Job realized that better than most. We all know that Job was called a perfect man, one that skewed evil and yeah. he loved righteousness he was not sinless by any means but yet he strived to serve God and we see that God allowed if you will Satan to attack him Satan to come up against him for him to have lots of trials we are not exempt from the same type of thing though yeah. so I'm reminded of Psalm 73 I want to turn there we can Go ahead and read the whole psalm here. Psalm 73. So Asaph here, he, he, he was a saved person. He tried to serve God, and he, yet he looked out and he saw the, how good the world had it, how good the wicked had it, and he was discouraged. Verse 1 of Psalm 73 says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But we can, I think all of us can say, Truly God is good to us. Truly He's been better to us than we deserve. But verse 2 goes on to say, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It was easy to look out and see the prosperous of this world, the wicked seemingly having no troubles, and in our flesh we envious after that. It says there are no bands or there's no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride can pass them about as a chain, violence cover them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart for wish. That verse sounds really good to flesh, doesn't it? We could have more than heart could wish. But what does it matter if you don't know Christ? Yeah. yeah. Verse 8 goes on to say, They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people returneth thither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Asaph here, he looked down the world and he said, they do all this wickedness and yet they have all this stuff. But they're prosperous in the way of the world, even though they are ungodly, even though they sin against God, even though they openly defy God even. And certainly to the flesh it's a discouraging thought, isn't it, to see that you say, well, God, why do you allow them to have such things? Why do not you bless me in such a way as the thinking of the flesh? He goes on to say in verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in intimacy. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it is too painful for me. Well, he had come to a point where it was almost too much to even consider. He said that really he had believed in God in vain. He had served him for not what 
place he had come to. But we don't serve God for the things of this world. Do we? we don't serve God for blessings necessarily in this life. The real blessings for the child of God are in eternity. Christ himself said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, be of good cheer, I will overcome the world. Uh, Verse 17, though he, this is where he finally comes to the, the truth, the realization of the truth. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Surely thou didst set them in a slippery place, thou cast them down in destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are early consumed with terrors? As a dream when one awakes, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. When he said he, when he went to the sanctuary of God, when he came down to the house of God, he saw therein that their end was destruction, that their end was condemnation. That one day that all their prosperity in this world, all their riches, all their goods will matter no more. They'll be one day burned up in the fervent heat, the Bible says. Mm-hmm. When they pass in this life, they won't take it with them. They'll be in utter destruction. Mm-hmm. And that is the end of all the wicked. No matter how good they may have it in this life. Mm-hmm. And then he was convicted of his his evil thoughts and will his his doubting God and his service for God. Verse number twenty-two he says so or verse twenty-one, thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reign, so foolish was I, and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by the, my right hand. He says, I, he confesses, he says, I was foolish, I was ignorant. To even think that that these wicked men were going to just get away with it, that I had served you in vain. But he says, even though I was such in a state, he says, basically, that God was good to me. That God still was with him, God was still withholding him. Verse 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. I think one day he'll receive us unto glory. One day there's a glory that is awaiting us that all the sufferings of this life are not really be compared to. Oh, if we forget that, if we look at the world rather than those things, we will get discouraged. Notice verse 25, Who have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all of them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Well, those that are, he says, far from God, he'll destroy him. Those that go a whoring from God, he will destroy them, he says, they will perish. Amen. That's a warning for all those that claim no Christ and then go back to the ways of the world. He said those will be destroyed. Oh, but for us it's good that we would draw near to God. That's really our comfort in this life, to draw near to Him. Not to draw near to the world or its things. Let's go back to our, our text, though. You know, there, when we were reading Psalms, he had said that he was plagued all the day long. He was chasing there every morning. You can be sure if you're trying to serve God, this, this trouble is coming your way. This, whether it's chastisements, afflictions, tribulations. Yeah. Despite what Mr. Olstein says, we're not going to have our best life now. Yeah. Not if we're trying to serve God, that is. No oh, man. His days are full of trouble, especially if you try to serve God. Sure. Verse number two, he goes on to say, He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth as a shadow and continueth not. A man's life is fleeting, isn't it? Is that the flower comes up, it's soon cut down and withers away. So First Peter 124, which is really quoting from Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8, says that all flesh is grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass, when it soon is cut off and withereth away. Yeah. But with the word of God, that will stand forever. Oh, flesh is cut off. Flesh will be 
will die one day. It will decay. It will wither away. Go back to the dust from whence it came. The only thing you can stand sure of is the Word of God. He says, as a shadow, it pleaseth as a shadow and pleaseth not. The shadow are soon gone with the moving of the clouds and the sun, aren't they? Shadow's there, maybe in the morning, and it's gone in the evening. Because so is our life. It's just here for a little while, then gone away. Or as James says in chapter 4, verse 14, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, then vanisheth away. Mm-hmm. Our life is just a short little while here on this earth. Yeah. What are we going to do with it? So, this life will soon be cut off for each and every one of us. And it might seem like a, a long time to the flesh, but it's really not any length of time at all in comparison to eternity. In comparison to the all eternity that awaits, this little 70, 80 years, if we could live that long, is nothing. We're going on to verse. Three, he says, And dost thou open thine eyes upon such a one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? He says, Do you have your eyes on such a one, this, this wicked man, this frail and short lived and full of troubled man, and bringest me into judgment with thee? He basically, I think, is saying, Why do you look upon me to chastise me and inflict me? To, so I think Job is talking about himself primarily. But, but we are no match for the full justice of God. Mm. Well, thanks be to God we have forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. But those that don't know Christ, they will experience his full justice when they are cast alive in the lake of fire that burneth day and night forever and ever. But no, God does chastise us. He does afflict us. Oftentimes, or I'd say all times for our good. For us that are born again, it's always for our good. But it might not seem joyous at the present time. But all things are working together for our good, he says, and he's working to conform us to the image of Christ. But we cannot stand in the power of our own flesh when it comes to facing the chastisements of God, when it comes to facing afflictions and tribulations, we must simply trust in him. Verse number four, he says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Is there any one, any man that can turn that which is filed, that which is impure, that which is pure? He, no man can He says, no, he says, there's not one, there's no one, no man that can cleanse himself. Only God can do such a thing. The priest cannot cleanse you, the pastor cannot cleanse you, you cannot cleanse yourself. So Revelation 1 and 5 tells us that Christ washed us in his own blood from our sins. Mm-hmm. We could not wash ourselves from our sins. But we took the blood of Christ to wash us from our sins. Titus 3 5 tells us that he washed us by the, or he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. By birthing us anew, by making us a new creature, by being born again, he has washed us. Not by us doing good works, not by us turning over a good a new leaf or trying to live a good life. But no, only God can take that which is unclean and turn it into that which is clean. Only God can take that which has been defiled and full of impurities and turn it into that which is pure. Or even fire than most fine gold. But going on verse 5, he says, Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. God has set man's days, and there's no adding or taking away from them. As much as man strives to live longer, to do everything to extend his life, very clear that God is here. He's determined his days. He's before even time existed, I believe he set our days. How many days we are to have? He goes on to say that number of months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. We have certain a boundary, if you will, that God has determined, he has appointed, he has 
ordained, and we cannot pass that time. A man spends lots of money, lots of efforts trying to extend his life, doesn't he? This man does not want to face death. The natural man doesn't. Oh, but man can waste all his time, all his energy, all his money, and he will not be able to outdo the bounds which God has set. But for the child of God, it is really to die is gain, isn't it? What Paul says in Philippians. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. He said he was in a strait betwixt having both a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. He said, nevertheless, it is more needful that I stay. But we should not be afraid to die as his people. We should be, we should realize that we have set number of days and we should strive to use them to serve God. I don't know your days, I don't know my own days, but we ought to be conscious that God has set our days and we are to use them to serve Him. Verse 6, he goes on to say, Turn from him that he may rest, that he shall accomplish as an iron in his day. Now, this term him doesn't mean that he wants the presence of God to be taken away from him. I think it is the afflicting in the hand of God he wants to be turned from him. So Job knew about afflictions better than most of us. He says, Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as an iron in his day. He wanted to just simply be able to serve God and finish the work he called, was called to do should not be our our desire that we could just simply serve God and do what he has called us to do certainly it's much easier when we're not afflicted to serve him but how we have to strive to serve him no matter what afflictions may come our way but if we can have rest we ought to ask God for rest he gives rest to the people of God. There remaineth a rest for us, he says. But we ought to be longing for that day in which we shall fully rest in Christ. <laughs> Verses 7 through 9, he describes this hope of a tree. He says, For there is a hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the sense of water it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant. You can cut a tree down if you leave it and it gets water and has enough time it will begin to sprout again. But there is not so much hope for a man as it verse 10 says, but man dieth and wastes the way. When man dies and he, he ceases to exist. He decays away. You can open up any of the graves out in the cemetery and you're going to find that man has been decaying away. If this natural body returns to the dust from whence it was taken, there is not hope that in and of itself it's going to sprout again. There's no resurrection outside of the divine working of God. We see in the scriptures how the God, through some of his servants, brought back those who were had died, yet outside of a circumstance like that, there is no coming back from the dead. There's no natural man to not wish himself back. Just the same spiritually, one cannot wish himself to be undead. Mm. <coughs> I'm sure if you could go out and speak to thousands of millions, if not billions of corpses in the cemeteries, they would say, yeah, I'd like to come back to life. I'm sure it'd be much better than being in the torments of hell. Yet when man ceases to exist, he ceases to exist. He doesn't sprout again one day. Man dieth and wastes away. Yea, a man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? He's not here on earth anymore. But when you die, where will your, where will your soul be? There's only two possibilities. Will it be in the presence of God or in hell in torments? There's no middle ground, there's no purgatory, there's no soul sleep. I, don't, I guess that's popular teaching because it sounds good to the flesh, doesn't it? No one wants to go to the torments of hell, but 
If you just go and be in an unconscious state for the rest of eternity, that wouldn't be so bad. No, hell it surely is a real place for all those that don't know Christ. For all the unsaved, that's where they will spend their time when they depart from this life. When you give up the ghost, where will you be? That's a, a thought to consider for all of us. Where will your soul be? You won't stay here on earth. You're, there's not going to be any, not going to be returning around to haunt anybody like many people think. No, you'll either open your eyes in hell or you'll be in the presence of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, that is the place you ought to desire. That is the place where we'll be free from sin, we'll be free from the effects of sin. First, 11, he goes on to say, as the water fell from the sea and the flood decayed and dries up, the waters flow out from the sea, they don't flow back into the sea, don't do they? The flood dries up, it's dried up. He likens this unto, so a man lieth down, he rises not. And when a man laid the rest, he doesn't rise up again. He said, apart from the miracles of God and scriptures and as we'll see here in a moment, one day we will rise again. But in of himself, man does not lay himself down in death and rise up again. I'm sure scientists would love to figure out a way to bring those back from the dead. I know they they want to try to do all these experiments and tests to extend life, to preserve the dead that they might be able to in the future raise them, but no man cannot cheat death. When death comes, it is a sure thing, and there's no reversing it. And that seems to be a lost truth in our day. Life is not held very valuable anymore. No, once when man lies down, he's not going to rise again, not till the resurrection, that is. As he says here, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. You can't go over there and shake him and wake him up. You're not going to go over there and you know, throw a bucket of water on him and he's going to rise up again. You can't set an alarm clock to wake him out of his sleep. The man goes to the sleep which we call death, he is not going to wake again until God raises him. And Job knew this. We can turn over to chapter 19 of Job. Verses 25 to 27, he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand the latter day upon the earth. And though my, after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reign be consumed within me. So his body be destroyed, we will see God in the flesh one day. Will this body die and decay? Yet we'll, we will be raised again one day. As 1 Corinthians describes it, chapter 15, this corruptible will put on incorruption, this moral will put on immortality. I think it's, I forget which letter it is now, but I think it's Philippians that says that he shall give us a, a body like his glorious body. But until that day, there is none going to rise again. First Thessalonians, we all familiar with chapter 4, it describes the first resurrection. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll read verses 14 through 17. He said, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that them also which slept in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, what a blessing it is to look forward to such a thing, isn't it? That we have such a hope that 
those which have went on sleep before us, and if we go on by the way of the grave, that, that is not the end for the child of God. Yeah. He says that we will be raised, and we will meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yeah. Well, that is a resurrection to look forward to. That is a resurrection which we ought to long for. But we want to turn to Acts 24, verse 15, describe that there is a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And the resurrection of the unjust will not be so glorious, will it? We can turn over to Revelation. It's Revelation 20. The first several verses describe Satan being bound and cast into this bottomless pit for a thousand years. Verse 4 describes Christ and those that are with him as reigning for a thousand years. And verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. But we that are saved, we will have part in this first resurrection as it's called here, and we shall live with him. We shall reign with him, he says. But there is a second resurrection coming, which is described on down in verses 11 through 15. When the dead, small and great, stand before God, and they stand before him in judgment, and that will be a resurrection that is not so glorious. It will be that they may be judged by their works and be condemned to the lake of fire. The verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That place which verse 10 describes as being tormented day and night forever and ever. Oh, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's your end. No matter how prosperous this life may be, no matter how easy you may have in this life, no matter how good of a person you may think you are, no matter how many times you go to church or if you've been baptized or who your parents are, if you don't know Christ as Savior, that is your end. But with thanks be to God for us that are saved while we have this glorious hope awaiting us that we shall one day be like Christ for we shall see him as he is and we shall put off sin forever we shall be forever with the Lord but this life is full of trouble Job says mm -hmm. it is full of afflictions and chastisements and tribulations but when death comes it is sure let us spend our days serving God. Let us spend what time God has given us here to bring glory to Him, not to our own self-satisfaction. So I know it goes against the, our modern society's teachings to live holy for God, but that is the command that God has given us as His people. And we think we have to have all these things of this world, and they have their time and their place, but oh, how we have to strive first and foremost for serving him. As Matthew 6 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the Gentiles, they seek after the things of this world, don't they? What they shall eat, what they shall drink, wherewithal they shall be clothed. And today, man seeks after all those things, plus what kind of car he's going to drive, what kind of house he's going to live in, what kind of, how big a TV he's going to have hanging on the wall. Not saying those those things in and of themselves are not sinful, but oh how they can often hinder us in our service to God. And I think Brother Jackson mentioned anything that comes between us and God, we've really made it a God unto ourselves. When we stop and consider the the righteous standard of the Word of God, we will find ourselves very short. But with thanks be to God, there is forgiveness in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that he doesn't 
hold us to that standard as the only way of salvation. We're not always clear we say, but yet Christ fulfilled that standard. He was the standard, if you will. He was completely perfect to the standard of God. We can only claim salvation through him. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ now shall be saved is the command. It wasn't do good works. It wasn't be baptized. It wasn't any of these other things. Or are you trusting in God? Or are you trusting in yourself? Or are you trusting in Christ and his finished work? Or are you trusting in something you've done? Or the things of this world? They will fail you. They will disappoint you, especially when you stand before God. Sin may be enjoyable for a season. Hebrews 11 says that sin has pleasure for a season. It's only for a season. It's only for a little while. Sin will always bring forth misery and eventually destruction and eternal condemnation. The way to sin is death is the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, oh, how we ought to thank God that for us, death is not a permanent thing. The death is really the doorway to the presence of Christ himself. And we ought to be so trusting in him that we know that he has fixed our days. It doesn't mean we should you know, jump out of an airplane without a parachute on. He gives us common sense, but oh how we we ought not to fear death itself. We ought to fear him who controls death. Fear not him which after or fear not them which can kill the body, but fear him which after it killed you have power to cast into hell. Yes, and you fear him. That was Christ's words to us in the book of Luke. When man spends his life trying to escape death, trying to prolong it as long as he can. Yet no amount of work he does will ever be able to prolong it. One day he will face death, and after this, the judgment, he says. But oh, for us that are the children of God, let us be busy about it. Let us spend these, these few days, as our text describes it, these fleeting moments that we have serving him. All the troubles of this life will seem as nothing when we stand before God. Is that song we sing? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. For the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. We can, let us not take your eyes off those things. Let us not focus on the world or we'll be like Asaph. We'll be discouraged. We'll be thinking we've served God in vain. But let us remember that the just end of the wicked is destruction. But well, for us, it is eternal glory and bliss in the person of Christ. And let us thank God for that. But, oh, if you don't know Christ, I can only point you to him. He's the only one that can save your soul. He's the only one that can uh, wash you from your sins. 